John Rule, read something for us today. This is the 25th of January, 2014, and and let's record something. Tell me what you've got in front of you. This is from the Great Depression. Yes, this is from the Depression years, 1936 through 1940, when we lived in dozens of places uh, from Kansas to the Gulf. And uh, when this opens, this, uh, the oil patch sequence, while well, we've just arrived there uh, in East Texas, near Tyler, uh, the group of little towns they call the oil patch, Arp, Overton, New London, in this old <clears throat> close to Tyler. And this uh, sequence begins when we've arrived. Nomads. Wake up, Jay. Stir your little stumps. We're in Texas. I need to straighten things and make up the bed. He jerked upright and opened his eyes. He was still in his overalls and knit shirt. His shoes were off and he was in a rumpled mess of bud bedclothes. As soon as his sock-clad feet hit the linoleum floor, Vida yanked the bedspread quilt and sheet down to the foot. Your shoes are under the bed. Get them on and run outside. Go play with those kids in the other cabin. I'll make you an egg and toast with jelly in a few minutes. He shook his head to clear it, rubbed his eyes, and looked around. A small, nearly square room with a bed in a corner, an open heater with gray woolly stuff in the back of it, a sink cabinet with a gas hot plate, and a pan and coffee pot on top, two windows with tan roller shades down. He reached his shoes from under the bed and sat on the floor to pull them on. Do you want me to tie them for you? He shook his head. He was five. Where's Daddy? He asked, looking up at the bed maker, still pulling and whacking sheets and plumping pillows. Oh, he's gone to work to get a little rabbit skin to wrap his baby butt again. Now, Scoot, I need a few minutes of privacy. Then I'll cook your breakfast and call you. She opened the door and shoved him outside with a laugh. He stood blinking on the doorstep midway of a sunny, breezy morning. He could hear girls laughing excitedly somewhere nearby, shrieking. He went cautiously around the end of the cabin. It sounded like they were down behind the second or third tourist cabin. All cabins were white with blue trim, low gable roofs, and narrow eaves. He went between their cabin and the next and peered toward the noise. He saw two little girls out on the grass dancing and laughing behind the second cabin down. They would point up, then double over, laughing. He edged farther out and glanced that way. He saw a wooden ladder lean against the cabin eaves with a dripping hose hanging through it. Then he saw the boy on the roof, swinging a tan, wiggly, swiveling, and shimmering thing that nearly reached the ground. It bounced and jiggled like it was alive from the boy's antics. Then the older girl began a sing-song chant. Mama, Mama, Daddy's got a rubber, Danny's got a rubber, Mama, Danny's got a rubber. From somewhere, a, a raucous woman's voice bellowed, Daddy, you little bastard, get your ass off that roof. The little girls ran away between the cabins. The boy on the roof let go with a fling, and the skinny balloon thing collapsed in a dying arc, squirting a final silvery gush across the yard. Then the boy practically fell down the ladder and ducks, ducked out of sight. Jay pulled his head back quickly and stood frozen against the cabin's end wall. What kind of people were these? He'd never before heard words like those the woman's voice yelled. From the way the girls acted, he knew the boy on the roof did something really bad, but he didn't know what. He went back to the front steps. When Vida opened the door, Jay was sitting there, arms around his knees, trying to remember how they reached here. All he could remember was a rattly hammering of the Model T engine chewing up gravel highways on skinny tires through Kansas and Oklahoma with stops for gas in the bathroom. Then waking up in the dark, scared to see his stepmother driving while his daddy snored against the door with his mouth open. He thought he recalled the Ford being turned around and backed up once like Vida warned him she might do when they crossed the Red River. His strongest and last memory was of being carried through, carried through a bare dirt yard lit up by a flapping, snapping flame atop a black pipe. The air stank and he heard rhythmic thumping sounds. He was laid on a bed facing a wall with a coarse coverlet against his cheek. He lay half awake, turned toward a window where flame, light, and shadow played. 
He smelled fresh coffee and listened to grown-ups' voices through the half-open door. Well, I've told my bunch that if it gets any worse even here in the oil fields, we'll just pack up and move back to those Ozark hills. You can grow anything there or you sure won't starve. Then his dad's grainy voice came. Well, I was at Anderson working on a dairy farm for a year or so, but I didn't have any ground of my own. We'll try it around Tyler. Vida's folks are here, and I'm sure there'll be something to do. People got to live somehow. Well, maybe your idea's best, Mr. Hedlund. You lived a lot longer. A hearty laugh came then. But I haven't learned anymore. Vida's voice cut in. You know, Mr. Hedlund, between us, we have a, couple, a lot of skills. I ran a linotype at the Courier Times. I even learned to operate the big press. I taught my brother enough Spanish that he could get a job with Gulf Oil and go off to Venezuela. I'm a good country girl gardener, and Ted here can do just about anything. He heard his dad laugh and say, That's right, you tell him, Vida Spider, Billy Goat Rider. And then Vida said, Ted Ross, I'm sorry I ever told you those school nicknames and the sounds of laughter and scuffling came. After that, he drifted off and woke as he was carried back past the snapping, popping torch in the yard and put on the car's back seat again. Then more rattling until he was lugged in here with a bare light bulb blinding him and dumped on the bed and his shoes pulled off. A man's voice said, just drop by the office in the morning, and that was all. Now the home farm, Grandmother Ivy, Uncle Willis, Brownie and the animals, the big warm kitchen, all that was a long way off and already seemed a long time ago. All this was too fast and too much. When the door of the tourist cabin opened, he looked around. Oh, you're right here. I thought I'd have to go find you and drag you away. Did you find the kids? Yes. What happened? Did you say hello? No. Their mama called and they ran off. His stepmother came down and bent over. The wings of her short hair almost brushed his face. Well, come on in, Jay. Get something to stick to your ribs. The Headlands loaned us some kitchen things and bread and eggs last night, and I fixed you a breakfast. Tomorrow we'll go into Tyler to see Mubby and Daddy Poe and Lois and Blanche, and then we'll drive out to the farm where I grew up. Doesn't that sound good? He nodded. Are we going to live here? Oh, for a while. We'll take care of a place Heath bought right down the road here. It'll be fun. Come on now. She reached her hand to him. He took it. It wasn't grandmother's, but it was a hand. The tourist court had a sanitary unit for laundry. His stepmother took him there to bathe him that night. You need a good bath after the trip, she said. We all do. And we're going to town to see my folks this weekend. He never liked baths much at the farm. Even in the big pantry there, it was drafty. It was cold on his back and too hot on his bottom. But his grandmother always made it easy for him. All he remembered was her brisk, loving care. But at the tourist court, the laundry building had a, a concrete floor. It was damp and chilly and kind of dark. A single bulb hung on a cord in the center. It smelled funny, but there was hot water from a red hose and a ridgy bottom number two metal tub just like on the farm. She made him get in and he felt the same shock of too hot, too cold. She scrubbed him lots faster than grandmother, mom did, kind of rough. After doing his chest and back and ears and neck and the backs of his legs, she stood up and tossed the washcloth into the water. There, she said, that's enough. You can do the rest in your old shag nasty yourself. The towel and your clothes are on the chair. Come on back when you finish. She left quickly. He sat still in the cooling water, feeling a way he never had before. Neither his mother nor his grandmother had ever made him feel like this in his young life, ashamed and dirty and sort of bad. He already sensed that boys and men were worse than girls and women. The word itself sounded bad enough. It had nasty in it, and he knew that was bad. For an instant, he wanted to cry. He'd never cried much, couldn't even remember it. After a bit, sitting hunched and shivery as he stared at the water, he began to fish around aimlessly, felt the washcloth, and began slowly to scrub himself down there. The visit to Vida's family was really different for him and sort of fun. They drove into the biggest town he'd seen since his tonsil operation in Kansas City and to a big roof two-story house with porches on two sides and lots of chairs on the porches. On the shady side, the porch was screened for hot weather. 
fig and flower bushes grew around one side and the back with lots of white gravel for parking. Mubby and Daddy Paul sat on the porch in big, big back chairs like baskets. Mubby was round like his great-grandmother Lizzie, but lots shorter. She didn't smile or even grin, but her face got softer looking when his stepmom bent down and hugged her. She had a silky cloth pinned on her hair and hanging to her shoulders. She reached up and fixed it right after they said hello. Elvira just did my hair, she told them. She barely glanced at Jay. Daddy Paul stood up and hugged his stepmom and bent down to him with a kindly look and said, So, is this the new young gentleman in your life? He held out a warm, dry hand that Jay took, staring up at the bony face, shrunk-looking but nice, with deep set eyes and bushy white eyebrows. This neat little old man reminded him of great-grandfather George, except for the white tobacco-stained mustache and the white suit. Everything pooched out and Mubby's face was hollowed out on his. Run in and look at Mubby's boarding house, Jay, Vida said, while your daddy and I visit here. Oh, but the dining table's already set, Mubby said. He won't hurt a thing, Vida said sharply. He's probably better behaved than some of the boarders. Go on, Jay. Jay hesitated, then went through the wide screen door his dad held open. He wandered down the polished floor of the hall, glancing into a long room of chairs and couches and magazine racks on his right, the dining hall on the left, another door on the right, then two tall gray swinging doors at the end. He paused and pushed them open to find himself in a big kitchen with black stoves on both sides. Two black ladies were busy at the stoves. The older one glanced around and smiled. You must be the little new boy, she said. I'm Gladys. The dining room is out that way if you wants to see it. He nodded but went to the back door to look out. There was a high white stoop and narrow steps with railings down to more white gravel parking and fig bushes against the back fence. Then he went to the dining room, long and narrow, with a polished table nearly the length of it. Tall straight chairs stood behind each place with a plate on its own little cloth square and silver beside it. In the middle, the salt and pepper and candles and extra little dishes and bottles all sat on their white squares. Suddenly a burst of talk and laughter with new voices mixed in came from the room full of chairs and sofas. He went back across the hall to peek in the arched door doorway. There he is, a voice rang out, and a slim brunette woman in white and tan clothes clip-flopped over to him on high, in high heels. Jay, I'm Lois, and that's Blanche over there. We're your new aunts. Y'all are coming out to the farm as soon as we eat. You're the cutest thing. My little girl will want to adopt you. The freckly blonde one she called Blanche laughed and crinkled her nose at him. He didn't know what to do when they talked like this to him. Nobody ever had in Kansas. He frowned at his stepmother standing by his dad. How come they look so different from you? He blurted out. Vida flushed pink and laughed. Well, Jay, they're all city types, but I wanted to stay on the farm. I'm the youngest and a tomboy. Now they were all laughing, all but Mubby. We should go to the table now, she announced, standing and moving toward the dining room door. They all trooped in after her and settled in the tall chairs. Mubby arranged herself in a different big chair with arms at the head of the table. Then she nodded to Blanche, who was nearest the swinging doors to the kitchen. Blanche hopped up and pushed a half door open a crack and nodded to the unseen Gladys and her helper. Where's Daddy, Paul? Jay whispered to Vida as she helped him get settled with a cushion underneath him. Oh, he went upstairs to lie down. He doesn't eat much, just gets a little from the kitchen when he wants it. Gladys and her helper came in quickly with steaming bowls and platters, ranging them between the table decorations. He was hungry all right, but the food looked kind of different. Vida, his dad said, why don't you help him get served? And quickly a spoonful of everything appeared on his plate, spaced around. Now you've got... Some of every kind of good East Texas food but figs and yellow watermelon, she said, and turned back to eating, chatting, and laughing with the others. Beside Jay, his dad was lively, too, enjoying his food and saying things that made Jay's new aunts laugh hard and glance at his stepmother. 
Meanwhile, Dre just picked away at his food, eating mostly the square cornbread, a drumstick, a bit of mashed potatoes and cream gravy, a few of the beans with one big dot on them, and something crunchy with cornmeal all over it. Now, what's this red stuff? He whispered to his dad. That's fried sweet potato, son. It's good. Jay tried it. It did taste pretty good, all right. Kind of strange. But the little pile of limp green stuff had a strong smell, and even with pepper juice sprinkled on, he gagged and put it back. This didn't escape Mubby. Can't he eat his greens? She asked Vida. Have Gladys take his plate if he's finished. As they did this, Vida whispered that good peach cobbler was coming and that she'd noticed he ate all of his fried okra. He nodded, guessing that was the cornmeal-y stuff. He hunched a little forward and sat drinking his iced tea and dangling his legs until the grown-ups' plates were taken off and the cooks brought in a tray of serving dishes filled with peaches and dough strips sprinkled with coarse sugar and a pitcher of cream. It was good, all right. He liked anything sweet. Some dough strips were awfully slicky and he had to swallow fast. Then he was allowed to get down and poke around in the lounge room, looking at magazines, until Mubby rose and led the way out, saying that the girls had to clear away and get ready for evening. She held her head with this draped hair covering, just so, for Vida to kiss her cheek and went slowly upstairs. Vida said goodbye to Blanche, and they followed Lois's car out to the farm. Blanche asked us to come out to their place on the lake next weekend, Vida said, but she says the lake is down from the drought and the leaking dam. The farm wasn't far out of town. They turned off the main road and up a gravel lane with grass in the middle and pulled up to a low white farmhouse with a weedy barn lot and barn out behind and a utility building with a tall antenna tower to the side. A slender grinning man with a shock of black hair came out of the screen side porch of the house, followed by a really pretty young girl with the same white skin and dark hair. Lois was already out of her car and took them by the hands, pulling them toward the T-model. Here he is, she announced, Jay. Here's Grace, Grace Florence. The young girl was half again as tall as he was and so pretty he was dazzled. Too fascinated to be shy, he let her grab his hand and pull him into the screen gallery of the house where they had to duck under clotheslines with drying black and white photo prints pinned on them. I was right in the middle of this batch, Lois declared. I'm learning, using up the old film he lets me have from the studio. I had to go off and leave him t to finish up. I left Grace to keep him company. He was trying to fix his ham radio, too. I can't fix it until we have another party, he said, because the bulb on the tower's burnt out again. His dad and the others laughed at that, and his dad said, How many beers did it take for you to replace the bulb last time, Heath? I don't remember. I don't either, four, I think, to get up my nerve, but it was easier after I got started up. Why? I couldn't back out with everybody watching and lightning moving this way. Grace Florence got bitten here two weeks ago by a black willow, Lois told him. She was helping Heath clean out the garage when it happened. We were really worried and got her right to the doctor, but it seems okay now. Show them your bike place, honey. The pretty nine-year-old pulled up her short skirt to reveal a scabby reddish spot centered high on the inside of her right thigh. Jay felt confused and abashed. He'd never seen that much of any girl or woman. It was more like a beauty spot on her. Lois raised a hand. Let's all go in the living room where it's good and dark, turn on the fans, drink something cool, and visit. The kids can go play. We're kind of settled, but the place is really only half ready to live in again. The family neglected it after Vida quit batching out here with Daddy Paul and went to work for the Courier Times. Grace Florence snatched Jay's hand again. Come on, I'll show you the farm stuff. They went past the sink with its acid smell, running water and blowing fans, and out through a doorless garage. That's where I got bit, she said, right over there, and pointed to a window in the open stud wall. They ran across Bermuda grass toward a gray barn jutting beyond the fringe of ragweed. They climbed the board fence and teetered above the weeds, and he looked around. He was still a little befuddled from it all happening so fast. Where, where are the animals, he asked. Oh, aren't any, she gasped. Didn't you hear, Mama? Nobody lived here for two years. Everybody but Daddy, Paul, and Aunt Vida moved into Tyler. Then she went to work in town, too, and they made Daddy Paul go live at the boarding house with Mommy. 
we just moved out here about six months ago and daddy had the tower put up for this ham radio he was on it all night in a bad ice storm sending messages will you ever get animals i don't think so mom and daddy are too busy they say they might get me a shetland pony and maybe a collie no oh. jay sat silent these people were totally different he'd already heard about drinking beer and stuff here was this beautiful girl named Grace, but nobody said Grace yet at meals. He was sure his grandmother Ivy would never eat without saying Grace or go to bed without praying. His dad did say Grace sometimes. Now this beautiful girl older than him, who seemed to know a lot, was asking him to tell about living where he came from. He started to, stumbling at first and then faster and faster, telling of uncles, barns, animals, a house, and grandmother, pets. A skunk, Gray exclaimed, a skunk for a pet. They stopped when Aunt Lois called them to come in for a treat. They scampered under the blowing photos to the electric refrigerator where Lois popped out frozen cherry flavor Kool-Aid cubes on broken matchsticks for handles. They suck at them happily. Grace Florence showed him her scrapbook of paper dolls crammed with clippings from magazines. That was strange to him, but he looked and nodded politely. Girls sure were different. They left in early dusk saying goodbye after he turned on the yard light. Grace Florence gave him a big hug and said, You sure can talk when it's after you get started. Will I be starting school now? Jay asked at breakfast. No, his stepmother told him. You can't go until next fall. Your dad asked the other day. You were born too late in the year. They have a rule about it. He told them about your school in Kansas, but they said, No, this was Texas. Well, what am I going to do then? You'll stay with us. We'll walk down to Heath's Club in a minute. We'll all take care of it. You can entertain the customers. She laughed hard. He was mystified. And even more when they walked down the hill and they saw the low, broad roof clubhouse. Nothing to see except a narrow door in the left corner and a small square window beside it with, in hot red neon script, the legend Nixie's Place. Who's Nixie? he asked. They waited for a single car to pass before crossing the gravel highway. Oh, he was the owner before Heath bought it. They crossed and entered the warm darkness beyond the door. In a minute, his eyes adjusted. He could see people at a long bar with a brass footrail, some couples in booths along the side, and hear music from a big, colorful Victrola thing by the booths. His dad came out of a small back room at the left end of the counter. Glad you got here, Vida. He said, these folks want Cokes, and I've got to go work the furnace. I just heard a bad norther is come moving down. Might hit here tonight. Come on, Jay. You can help me stoke the furnace. He followed his dad around the gravel drive that led behind. The ground rose to a flat parking space, place atop a bank. Against the bank was a bunch of glittering clear glass bottles, flat ones, and dozens of shiny metal bottle caps that looked like crowns. He'd never seen so much new stuff just dumped before. A sudden clanging made him turn to see the open furnace door. This is what heats the club, Jay, his dad said, raking the coals and ashes with a long iron hoe. They made the furnace from a highway culvert. He tossed the tool aside and turned to a pile of old power pole sections cut twice as long as Jay was tall. He carefully shoved two of them into the glowing mass, pitched in two more, and clanged the door to, then gingerly turned a metal bell on the outside. There, that ought to keep anything from freezing tonight. Jay went back to the pile of shiny flat bottles and painted Coke caps. You can stay here and play with those some if you want. Jay set up a line of the bottles with the Coke caps lined up in front like soldiers. He noticed a dab of honey-colored liquid in the bottom of one bottle and worked at the stopper till it came loose with a satisfying thum sound and a medicine smell. He sniffed it, then coughed and made a face. It kind of took his breath away. It was a little like the smell in the club, but a lot stronger. He jumped up and looked around, nothing but sunshine in the gravel lot. He went around to the club's front door just as it was closed, letting out a burst of juke music and the words, Haul off and love me one more time. Jay clutched at the knob just as the door opened again with a man coming out. He grinned down at Jay and said, You want in, Mr. Man? And stood aside to let him by. Jay went straight back past the bar and into the back room. He saw Vida sitting by a cot where a young woman lay with an arm over her face. He stared at the woman on the cot. 
Hello, Jay. Did you find something to play with outside? Uh-huh. Is she sick? He couldn't keep from looking at the cot. Well, not really. She didn't feel too good, so I said she could lay down here a little bit. Are you hungry? He shook his head. We'll go up and fix dinner in a couple of hours. Meantime, you can have a baby Ruth if you get hungry. Unsure of what to do, he lingered in the doorway, watching his dad behind the bar as he opened cokes, grinned, and talked to people on the stools. He caught pieces of their talk. Gonna run a clean honky-tonk, huh? Boy, that'll be the day. And one of the women said, Oh boy, here comes Marie. The door swung wide and a dark-haired young woman came in, flashing a smile. Another girl and two men followed. Marie came skipping straight for the open stools in the middle of the counter. Not there, Marie, someone warned. He's got the furnace blower on. It'll blow your dress off. Marie laughed but kept coming. Then suddenly left straight up, slapped the low ceiling with a slipper, and came down in a curtsy, still laughing. Now all were laughing, whistling, yelling, and clapping. Are you dancing tonight, Marie? A woman asked. Marie nodded, smiling, and spread open the light cloth coat to show more of the spangled dress her leap had revealed. All of this stunned Jay. It was like the circus he'd heard of. He edged up to his dad. Is she a circus lady, Daddy? No, son. She's a professional dancer. Oh, Marie, Marie, I want to show you my boy. He suddenly snatched Jay up and stood him atop the red Coke cooler behind the bar. Marie edged between two others, and Reese's slender, perfumed hand to squeeze Jay's shoulder. Hello, dear. She smiled on him dazzlingly. Oh, Ted, he's so cute. No wonder you had to go get him. What's your name, dear? Jay. You sure got your daddy's good looks. A loud ahem came from Jay's stepmother standing in the back room doorway. Oh, don't worry about it. I'm not a vamp or a cradle robber. Charlie's got me all tied up, haven't you, Charlie? One of the men she'd come in with laughed and shook his hands over his head. Vida laughed, too. Marie, uh, Edna's back here. Doesn't feel too good. She wants to see you a minute. Marie nodded and swirled around the corner counter to the back room. Well, how'd you like it? His stepmother asked as they trudged uphill to the tourist court. It was fun. He added, I liked some music, and when they sang... Someone had put coins in the Nickelodeon and like a choral group, they all sang along from the booze in the bar, sort of sweet and mournful. Trouble in my mind, I'm blue, but I won't be blue always. And the other night, dear, as I lay sleeping. A moment later, thinking about it, he asked, why are there so many songs about sunshine? His stepmother gave her a short laugh and squeezed his hand. He was getting used to her laughs. Well, Jay, people need sunshine now. It just means hope. Banks and things they trusted just went flat. My own brother kind of went to pieces, and I had to help him get started again. Oh, he nodded like he knew. It was turning colder and blustery now with a fine face-tightening mist. They hurried to get into the tourist cabin. When he woke at morning, it was really cold and dim in the cabin. His dad was gone, but Vida was still in bed with her black coat and the worn car robe from the forge spread over the covers. The open gas heater was on high and hissing, turning its asbestos backing orange. He could hear wind and rattly sounds against the cabin walls. He crawled across the bed to pull the paper roller blind aside. The trees back of the cabin stood bent and laced with glinting ice under a lowering gray sky. Silvery ice pine limbs lay snapped beneath in a tangle of frozen grass. We're caught in an ice storm, Jay. Stepmother's voice came muffled from the pile of bedclothes. Your daddy's down at the club. Electricity's all off because of ice and falling branches broke the lines. Did you hear the tree limbs snapping last night? No. He felt scared. What will we do? 